ISTL Studenten, liebe Gäste, liebe Freunde des ISTL, kommt herein. Wir wollen gleich beginnen mit der nächsten Session. Wir hoffen, ihr habt alle eine gute Pause gehabt. Wer hat 50 Liegestützen gemacht? Mal Hände hoch. Simon. Oh, da war jemand. Ja, zwei, sehr, sehr gut. Genau, ja, wir hoffen, ihr konntet die Zeit nutzen, um zu verschnaufen und seid jetzt wieder ready für die zweite Session mit Dr. Roberts Leerden. Ähm, genau. Er ist noch nicht da, ja. <lacht> aber er wird sicher gleich auftauchen. Ja, sonst überbrücken wir noch mit Zungengebet. <lacht> yes. Ja, kommt alle herein und auch unser ähm, Redner, Dr. Roberts Leerden. Where are you? Wenn jemand eine oui. Tochter gesehen hat, bitte auf die Bühne bringen. Genau. Oder Heinz kommt rein, vielleicht kann Heinz überbrücken. Ja, oh ja, genau. Stefan, Stefan, du kannst noch kurz auf die Bühne kommen und uns einen Witz erzählen als Überbrückung. Let's go. Applaus für Stefan. Also da sind äh, zwei Missionare in zwei Missionare waren im Urwald und dann sind sie da von den Eingeborenen, die haben sie da äh, gefangen genommen und schon das Feuer heiß gemacht und dann haben sie ihnen gesagt, okay, ich habe noch zwei, äh, einfach noch einen Wunsch und der eine war wirklich so zitterig und die haben gesagt, keine Angst, du hast noch, du hast noch äh, einen Wunsch und er hat gesagt, okay, ich nehme einen Becher Wasser und ein Zahnstocher. Und die Eingeborenen dachten, also Wasser ist, verstehe ich, aber ein Zahnstocher ist schon komisch. Und dann hat er da das Wasser, das Wasser getrunken und nachher den Zahnstocher genommen und hat er so gemacht. Aus mir macht ich keine Trommel. Yes, vielen Dank. Applaus Danke, für Stefan. Stefan. Das war sehr inspirierend. Yes. <lacht> genau. All right. Unser Doktor ist äh, bereits eingetroffen. Sehr, sehr gut. Um, yes, genau. Ich wechsle jetzt gleich wieder auf Englisch, um, damit uns Dr. Roberts uh, Lierden auch versteht. Thank you so much, uh, Roberts, for the first session. Vielen Dank, Roberts, für die erste Session. I would say it was uh, quite challenging, but in a good way. <laughs> ich würde sagen, es war eine Herausforderung, aber eine gute Herausforderung. Y yes, you can go ahead like this. We like it. <laughs> du darfst gerne so weitermachen. Wir mögen das. Yes, genau. We discussed about the point you said that we are not called to um, stay where we are, but to go. Wir haben darüber ausgetauscht dass Gott sagt, wir sind nicht berufen, um stehen zu bleiben, sondern zu gehen. Yes, and I think that's a really uh, important point for all of us. I hope for you as well, that when you are here, that we are called to go. Ich hoffe auch für euch ist das ein wichtiger Punkt, dass wir berufen sind, zu gehen. Yes, so that the book of Acts can be written more forward with the story of every one of us. Dass die Apostelgeschichte mit uns weitergeschrieben wird. Yes, genau. And now, yeah, let's give him a hand and welcome him on the stage again for this Geben next wir session. Einen Applaus. I changed my shirt. I didn't think I'd sweat that much, so I went to the hotel and changed. When you want to do the batteries, just come up and grab the batteries and you can change them and do that. I've written 100 books so far. Has anybody read any of my books? Good, you have. You probably read that one, right? That's the first one. I've written seven more. So yeah, these are great books. I don't have them here with me in German. I have them only in English. And I brought some of my other good books that I teach you. Here's one that I kind of preached a little bit this morning. Good God versus bad God. Which God do you see? And I help you change. Because God's nice. It's the devil that's bad. Amen. Can you hold those for me? Praise You got muscles, you can do that. Praise the Lord. All right, so is, are they going to bring the batteries or just when you, when you get them, just come up and change them? Amen. All right, everybody survived the first session? Anybody go home? All right, yep. Somebody went home? Okay. There's always a few people I drive out. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, we're going to do it a little bit different in the sense that I'm going to be a little more focused here for a moment. 
and we'll have pictures. Do we have pictures up there? We're going we're gonna to talk about this guy. You might know who this is? Good man with the beard. All right, bingo, you won that one. All right, we're going to start talking about different people. Now, what I do, so you understand, is I tell you their story, and as I go through their story, I start making applications to things. And so I will tell you the good and the bad, all right? Now, I tell you the challenging part so that you won't make the same mistake that they made. Or the people that you will minister to in the future, you might have this as a story to help be a signpost, like don't go down this road or do go down this road, all right? Everybody I talk about, I actually like. There's nobody I'm mad at. So I like all these guys. So if, I, if they were alive, I'd be on the front row putting money in their bucket, okay? But I'm going to tell you the story, uh, good and bad and indifferent, okay? Because the devil's the same in every generation. Human nature is the same, and that's how this stuff works. The giftings from God pretty much work the same law, the same principle, but they differ in how they're received, how the warfare happens, so we're going to do that. The man on the screen's name is John Alexander Dowie. He was born in Scotland, of all places. He's a Scottishman. And uh, when he was uh, a little boy, by the time he was, what, seven, eight years old, he had read the Bible through and taken a vow to never drink or smoke or defile his body because God had a work for him to do. So let's talk about those two things right now, drinking and smoking. Good evening, everybody. Um, these two things are very much an issue. Uh, in Christendom, Pentecostal Christianity, if you smoked or drank, you went to hell. Anybody raised like I was raised? Now, that's not the Bible. That was just our tradition. Now, the reason why they did that, so sometimes when our forefathers were very adamant on something like that, instead of just throwing it all out because their conclusion was not right, they wanted to scare you to not do this, not reason with you, all right? So they wouldn't tell you why they didn't want you to drink. They just said, if you drink, you're going to go to hell. And that don't go over, all right? So let me talk to you about why they're like that. Let's take Hillsong. Everybody know Hillsong? All right? Hillsong's in a crisis, all right? I know Brian, I know all of them. They're great people. I love the music. I like going to the mall, and between rock and roll people, there's Hillsongs. That's wonderful. I and mean, that's, that's a great moment in our life to have that on the national radio stations or our nations. So they did something to change the world. But the thing blew up because it began with the lawlessness of drinking, all right? Now, the Bible does not say don't drink. It says don't get drunk. Sure, it's quiet now in our church service, all right? So, like I said, I came from the Pentecostals where everything's going to ascend and you're going to go to hell for it. That's the way they preach it so they wouldn't, so you wouldn't go there. So the drinking issue in Europe is different than the, what's in America. You all drink over here. When I came to Europe the first time when I was, what, 20, 21, I still kind of believe if you drink, you go to hell. So all my preacher friends after the conference were drinking at the meal. So I had to go figure out, were they going to hell or not? So that, that's why I began my evolution in the drinking situation. So conclusion is you can drink and not go to hell. The reason why our forefather said don't do this is this. Listen to me very carefully. Is you can live right for 40 years and drink correctly for 40 years. And the one night you go past that one drink and you get drunk. It's not your intention. But you've lived right for 40 years. And the one night you cross it, you say something, you do something you would normally not do because you're not in your right control of, your, of yourself. You make a mistake and you lose everything you've done for 40 years because of one night or one afternoon, all right? So my request to you, is it worth it to do something or have it in your life where one moment where you make a mistake or you're not conscious of what you're doing and you step across and you go into a drunken moment and you do something. You lose your reputation. All your 40 years that you've built, 
everything. Look at Hillsong. If you go back to see what happened, it began with allowing drinking to be free, and it all comes with all the other stuff. And it blows up with its leaders because one day they went too far. Is that worth it? You have to decide that. Now, my forefathers said, he'll go to hell. That's not true. You won't go to hell. But there are things you can do that maybe you should choose not to do because if that moment happens, all your suffering to get where you are and all the prices you pay to get there, gone in one night. It's up to you. I choose not to drink. I drink more in Europe than I do anyplace else. They order me drinks, so I take a polite sip, so my drinking all year long is about that much for a year. My choice. I choose that. I have not worked my whole life to destroy it in one afternoon of drinking too much. Because no one sets out to drink too much. But it happens. You choose. You choose. I'm your friend either way. And if you make a mistake, I'm still your friend. Because problems don't scare me. Jesus fixes problems. And he can make things work. But Jesus is easier to get along with than his people. Church people are like an elephant. They remember everything. And you can be 20 years from that thing, and they'll bring it up. Okay, it's up to you. Do you want to lose Hillsong? Do you want to lose your ministry because of that? Your choice. Now, in my country, we have a new thing called pot. Weed, marijuana. What are you guys call it over here? Weed. Obviously, you know more about that. Grass. Oh, grass, okay. In my country, because of the liberal Democrats and the idiots that are running my country right now, they're making all this stuff legal, okay? We have a new problem with preachers in America. They want to smoke pot because it's legal. I've been offered pot before church. Now, think about this. Would you like? No, I do not. But they think it's okay because it's legal. Just because something is legal in the nation or in the culture does not make it right for us as Christian leaders. All right? Let me just go a step further. We'll, we'll get to Delhi in a minute. Here we go. There's going to be a lot of things that's okay in society that we're going to have to stand up to. If you choose to be a minister, you live a restricted life, okay? What I mean by restricted means there are things you should not and could not do as a minister that if you're not one, you could do. Does that make sense? All right, so you're choosing a ministry path that says you will have to live a restricted life, a life that other folks do these things and you should not because you're a, you're a minister, all right? If you cannot live that way, then don't be a minister, okay? If you cannot live happily the restricted life that comes with being a minister of Jesus Christ, I ask you today to quit and go get a job and be a nice Christian. Okay? So ministry is not like every other career. It's a holy calling. You're set apart, and a part of being set apart is a lifestyle, okay? A standard that we must reach for. Now, we, we have to grow in it. When we miss it, we got to fix it and get back where we're supposed to be. We're not perfect, but we, we got to do that lifestyle, and that's your standard. You can't make an excuse. You've chosen this, and after this conversation, you know what you're choosing. I'm telling you. You are choosing a lifestyle that has restrictions related to it because of who you represent in the earth. The minister should live a certain standard, a certain lifestyle. Okay? Now, I know different Christian groups have different standards, but they have them. 
Good preaching, Brother Robert. Amen. See, being an anointed man and woman of God does come with some requirements, does come with a price you pay to have it and to be it. If you don't want this, I'll say it for the second time, if you can't do this, you don't want this, and you can't live this, quit right now. Go find another career and live happily ever after. Go. Move. Get out. Don't come back. Is that rude enough? Did you get it? Because you have a lifestyle. You, you just can't live how you want to live with everybody else. You have to live a certain way. And your friends will treat you different. Okay? That's part of being a preacher. Not a businessman. A preacher. Okay? Sure, it's quiet now. Should I wait a while for you to process all of this, and then I'll preach some more? Have you been taught this in school yet? What it is and why? Just because you can does not mean you should. For me, I'll say it again, some of my friends drink. I don't condemn them. I'm not mad at them. I don't. Because I don't want to have lived from my 12 years of age to 58 and do something while I'm here in Switzerland and lose everything. It's not worth it. I'm not that anointed to keep alcohol under control. It works. No one sets out today, today I shall commit adultery. They don't happen like that. Today I shall get drunk. They don't happen like that. That's the way it's gossiped about. But over time, things happen. If you don't become aware and get help or fix things, things happen. All the ministers and myself, when you wake up from something and you're in a mess, like, how did I get here? It's usually where you relaxed a standard. Now, okay, let me go a bit further. All these guys they talk about, every one of them did something stupid, like you. We all have, okay? We're human. Sometimes their act destroyed everything. Sometimes it was a momentary stop, regroup, and go back, and, and it worked. Praise God, many of them recovered. So no matter how anointed you are, you're still human, and you have to deal with that. The, where most of the problems come in is in the unawareness of exhaustion. Hear me. Tired people permit things in their life they wouldn't permit any other way. Tired people do things they normally would not do. Where most of the problems that come into a minister's life comes first to the door of tiredness and exhaustion, okay? There's three kinds of tiredness. Number one, physiological tiredness. Your body, you're tired. There's mental tiredness and spiritual tiredness. You can be strong in your body and tired in your mind. You can be tired in your mind and, and weak in your spirit, too, at the same time. What's dangerous is when you're tired, spirit, soul, and body, because those three tiredness, you, you take care of three different ways. Okay? Physical tiredness, you have to rest your body. Resting does not just mean sleep. Sometimes it means get out from under the load that you're responsible for and breathe. Okay? Mental tiredness, there's five parts to your mind. Let me give them to you. Three main, two minor. Five parts to your mind, your soul. It's your will, your emotions, your intellect, your memory, and your imaginations make up your soul. So when you're tired in your mind, you can be exhausted emotionally. You can be intellectually deficient, and when there's not information going to the intellect, you can get tired and let the long thoughts in. There's different ways you've got to deal with your mind. Most of you are led by your feelings, your emotions. And that's not how you live as a Christian. 
You're led by your spirit, not by your head. You are a spirit that owns a mind that lives in a body. Write that down. Let me give it to you again. You are a spirit that lives in a body. This is mine. I live in this. I would like a new one, but I can't get a new one. It's 58 years old. It kind of shows it sometimes. You know, my body. When I die, this is what stays on earth. Everything else goes. Praise the Lord. All right? I live in a body, and I own a mind, my computer. When God talks to you, he does not talk to the computer. He talks to your spirit. But if you're not spirit-led, you don't hear God's voice. And that's why there are people who don't believe God speaks today because they're trying to hear God through the computer, their head. And you don't talk to your head. That's like me coming, and instead of talking to you, I'm going to grab your computer, and I start talking to the computer, how are you doing? I have a word for you. And I'm talking to something you own, not you. So when you make God talk to your head, that's what you're doing. And God don't talk to your head. He talks to your spirit. Thank you, sir. You get it? So I need to teach you some more. All right? You are a body. With your body, you contact the natural world. You own a mind. You are not a mind. You own one. You have to renew your mind, control your mind, and tell your mind what to do. Wigglesworth. You all know Wigglesworth? All right. Here's a Wigglesworth story and a quote for you. Summerall went to his house and knocked on his door to see him as a young man to the old man. First time to see Wigglesworth. Wigglesworth comes to the door, and he's a big guy. He fills the whole door frame. And, and Summerall goes, good morning, Mr. Wigglesworth. How, do you, how are you today? And he responds, I don't ask Wigglesworth how he feels. I tell him how he feels, and he feels good. <laughs> All right? Do you see what he's doing? His spirit is governing his body and his mind. And he would say this, often like we say this, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I hear. I am moved by what I believe from the Word, by the Spirit. Okay? That's how he lived. He didn't, he didn't live out of his mind. Okay? Your mind has to be rested. Sometimes you have to get away from the pressure of everything. You need to regenerate the energy of the, the life of your soul. And then there's spiritual tiredness. When your spirit person is exhausted. And in ministry, you can get tired spiritually because you give and you give and you give and you give. And if there's nothing going in, pretty soon, what are you giving? You're just going through the motions. There's no joy. There's no excitement because you're like, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. You're tired. All right? Every preacher needs these three holidays every year. Write these down. And do them. I command you. All right? Three holidays a preacher needs every year. Let me tell you a story for him. I was pastoring my church in Southern California. And um, there's a man named Fred Price. He was a great word of faith teacher that built a big 10,000 seat church in Compton down in the bad part of L.A. He was an African-American pastor, great man of God. He came to Europe. Somebody mainly stayed in California and pastored his big church. So he came to preach in my camp meeting, and it was like a big deal because to me he was part of the Trinity. You know how you put people way up there? He was way up there. He was really big to me. He was one of the guys I respected. So he came to preach me for the first time. I thought, wow, he's coming to my church to preach in my camp meeting. So I, I, I love lunch because you get two sermons, I get three. I get a lunch sermon. So I take him to lunch, and I can ask him all kinds of questions. And um, so I asked him, I said, what would you give to a young pastor advice to do what you've done. What, what, what's the advice? And I thought, read Greek, no Hebrew, all this kind of stuff. And he, and he puts down his fork and knife for eating lunch. He looks at me in the very, whoo, book your holiday first and don't change the date. And he goes back to eating. I thought, what was that? It was, I, I, I never expected. it. And I almost thought, oh, well, that was crazy. So about a year later, I realized he was right. 
because your 10-day becomes seven-day. Your seven-day becomes five-day. Your five-day becomes three, and three-day becomes no day. And pastors will go for years without a break. That's why you go crazy. Pastors and their families need a holiday. And there's, thank you for the three amens on that. The rest of you are still going, I don't know. Well, then be tired. Three kinds of holidays. Number one, a spiritual holiday. What is a spiritual holiday? A spiritual holiday is where you take time off, you plan and you spend money to go to a meeting like this or a, a conference or someplace to sit, not to prophesy, not to be seen, but to take in. You sit and you take in. And if they have a prayer line that you fit, you get your famous gospel butt up out of that chair and get in that prayer line and let people pray for you. Because yes. we need prayer ourselves sometimes. And we sometimes think because we're known by people, it's not right for us to get in the prayer line. Yes, it is. I freak my ushers out all the time because I get in the prayer lines in my camp meeting. When I have guest speakers and I'm the pastor and they call something out, if I have an ache or a pain or whatever's going on, I get up and stand in the prayer line with all the people. And the usher will go, what's he doing? I said, I need prayer. And they're confused. <laughs> because preachers don't do that. Yes, you do. Why sit there and act important and suffer? When you can get your butt up there and get healed or get free and be happy next week. Instead so of like, praise the Lord, we had a great camp meeting. I'm glad, but I'm still pay stupid idiot. Get in the prayer line and get healed. Get in the prayer line and get delivered. Get up there and be free. <laughs> Amen. Get rid of your pride and just be a great servant of God. And my church members love that their pastor would get in the prayer line with, I'd go stand in the prayer line. Go on, and they'd put me up here and I'd stand here with all the rest of them. They'd hit me and I'd fall down sometimes. Sometimes I didn't. But I got blessed. I got healed. I got helped. Don't be so famous. You can't get your gospel butt out of that chair and get in a prayer line and let the morning that's there help you. No matter who it's on at that moment. I'm so glad people pray for me. They grab my head and they pray for me. Some hit me. Whatever it takes, I'll take it. It don't matter to me. I've lost all of that. I don't care. I don't care. I want to be happy. I want to be free. I want to be healthy. And if it takes me getting out of my prestige of the pride of being the pastor of this great church and get up there with everybody else, I don't care. I want to be happy when I go home that night. I want my body healed. Why well, sit there and pray for everybody else and you suffer? And you have 15 medications at home from doctors. When you could have gotten the prayer line and had no medications. Back to the holidays. Thank you. Um, are you enjoying this? Okay. Spiritual holiday. Every one of these you have to spend money on. And you have to plan. You pray, where, where, where do you want me to go this year, Lord? Where, what, what, what spiritual place do I need to go? I mean, it don't have to be the famous place or the big event. It just needs to be the right event for you. Where do you need to go? To sit. Because sometimes I go to church, little church meetings out in the country. I hear about something like, you know, I want to go to that one. And I still do. I walk in and freak them out because they know me. Are you preaching? No, I've come to sit. What does that mean? Sit. <laughs> I've come to receive. And it's the best thing that I do in my year for me. Your second holiday is called the Mickey Mouse holiday. All right, I know. Can I explain what I mean by that? I use the word Mickey Mouse because it's the holiday that you and your family, whatever you like to do, go do. For me, well, this might be changing now. I used to say, I don't want to go to the mountains with all the snow. Now, with you, it might be a different story because those things are really interesting out there. They're beautiful. I want to go touch them. I want to go walk on them or do something, you know. I, I like the other white stuff called sand and palm trees and beaches. So whatever you like to do, go do. The other thing I like to do, I like to go to old historical places and hunt books. 
I'm geeky. So I, I do that for fun. When I'm bored, I go hunt an old book uh, about a revival or a preacher I'm trying to find, and I'll hunt books and go through all kinds of bookstores for a week and come home with treasures. And that's fun for me. That's relaxing. It may be torture for you. But that's what I enjoy. What do you do? What do you and your family like to do? Maybe it's fishing. Me and my dad used to go fishing and shoot things. I don't shoot things anymore. I still fish some, but, you know, not as much as I used to. But I like that. Now, that, what do you like to do? Plan it, spend money on it, and do it every year. Your third holiday called Stay Home and Enjoy Your House and Your Neighborhood. How many people live in a city and they never do anything in that city that that city offers them, and they pastor there, they work there, they don't go to the whatever they have, the beach or the movies or whatever they do in that city. They don't do anything. I was living in California, and I was there about, what, five, six years past, and I said, when's the last time you've been to the beach? Because he knows I like the beach. I said, I see it every day. He says, no, not see it, go to it. He rebuked me. I push you at a beach in Southern California. I lived 10 miles from the beach. And never went. I drove by it. I said hi to it. I saw the sunset, but I never got wet and sandy. Until after that day, I started going. When God spanks you, you get spanked. And you remember. These are the three holidays you need. You have to plan them, and you have to spend money. Money. <laughs> spend money to book the time. The whole, what are we going you have to plan it and spend money on it. Okay, what's a good holiday? It's a holiday that your kids, when they get to the place you're going, don't start saying, I want to go home. That's a bad holiday. A good holiday is when they, it's time to go home, they start crying, I don't want to go. Good holiday. That's how you can gauge it. Okay? If you do not do this, hear me. You will do something stupid in your life and ministry that could be devastating to everybody. Why do preachers commit adultery? Why do preachers die early? Why do they lose their mental stability and common sense? They never took a break. Jesus owned a pillow, and he used it. He was on a boat in a storm, asleep, on a pillow, Jesus took a break in a storm. They woke him up. Don't you care we die? I'm on holiday. <laughs> Why don't you take care of the storm yourself? All right. If he owned a pillow and he used it, you should too. Okay? The reason why people... In ministry, grow weary and ugly. That face, you know that face? Because they never rest. They never rest. And the devil, if he can't get you from going into ministry, let's kill you in the ministry. And that's how he does it. That's how it starts, folks. Everybody still with me? And religious people always want to destroy your holidays. Where are you going? Well, I wouldn't go there if I were you. Number one, you're not me. So shut up. You're going to tell these religious people to shut up and back off or they'll come into your life and ruin everything you do with your family and for yourself. And they'll do it every time. So what I did, I'm just proactive. I tell everybody, here's where I'm going. See you and go. When I come back, I tell them everything I did. I Facebook it. So there's no mystery. Well, I don't think a pastor should do that. Well, you're not God, so shut up. <laughs> did Jesus leave the throne and put you on it? No, hush. You have to be a little bit rude sometimes to take religious spirits and push them out of your life or they'll ruin every joyful thing in your life. Every one of them. So I, have, I don't think so. Who asked you? <laughs> Who asked you? My church bought me a 
brand new BMW one year. I didn't ask him, I was happy with my car. They rolled it in to the front of the church in front of the pulpit. We had a big altar space, you know. And they were keeping me in my office a little bit. I knew they were up to something, but I didn't know what it was. So the whole church had gotten there, and they had secretly bought me a brand new 740 stretch BMW. And they rolled it in, put it in the altar with a big bow on top. And it was mine. And I took it. And I accepted it. And I beat the horn for a week. I loved my $73,000 car they bought me. I didn't ask them. They give it to me. It's nice. It's nice to have gifts like that. You feel really good. You feel, wow. And you should. It's great. So I was parking my little parking space back behind the church where I, where I park all the time. And this church member, I don't think you should drive a car like that. I said, come here. You never will, but I will. So shut up. If you don't like your pastor driving this car, go to another church. Good day. That's how I pastor. I do not get tortured by demons and religious church people. I am going to be free. Not lawless, but free. You're not going to take joy from me. You're going to take the blessings that God gives me. And if you don't like it, there's dead, dumb, poor churches all over town you can join. Find them. Go. Move. Get out. Leave me alone. I will have a good time. That's how you pastor. If not, you'll be tortured. You will be tortured, especially in Europe. Because I can tell by the way you look at me right now, I can't ever, you should. But they're going to talk about, they're talking about you anyway, so just give them more ammunition. <laughs> if you're going to be persecuted, go first class. If they're going to be, they're going to come to get you, just have a great time. They're going to be mad at me because I talk the way I talk. The sarcastic that I preach here. My American nationality, my Pentecostalism makes people mad. I love it all. It's who I am. If you don't like it, leave. I like me. I like how God put me together. I like my sarcasm. I like my history vein. I love the way I am. I go back to my room, and I'm happy, and I don't go, oh, I'm thrilled that I got to come to Switzerland and yell for two days <laughs> and talk like this because you don't hear this kind of thing in Switzerland. They're too nice to you. That's why you're not winning on certain battlefronts of the kingdom here, because you need somebody like me. You do, especially you. Okay? I realize what I am. I'm the guy God comes in to say the things in a way that you hear them and understand them, and I don't do any suggestion. Bam! That's why he put me together. That's why he sends me places. It happened to be this is the week he sent me to you. And I'm going to challenge everything about you. We'll say, I'm not called like you. I'm not talking about individual. I'm talking about just being a minister. How many happy pastors do you see? How many happy families do you see in ministry? Very few. Because of things I'm talking about right now. When dad does come home or mom does come home, they're too tired to be mom and dad. That's why the kids rebel against God and leave. God took everything from them. God made us poor. That's what they say. And they leave the ministry because they don't want nothing to do with a God that took their parents away from them and gave them no money to go on a holiday or to have a decent home. And they walk out. That's what happens. More than not, we have to make a change in our generation, especially in Europe. You guys have got a battle worse than I have in America because you're socialistic. You've lived in a socialistic thing where people take care of you. You all want to be in a false equality. I need you to be big, loud, and rich so you can do your call 
for Jesus. All right, let me just sit down for a while on that. You liked it up until the word rich, right? All right, we'll get to doubting in a minute. Why do you have a problem with being rich? Why is there an issue with money and Christians and ministers? Why? Why do you get nervous when I say rich in a list of nice things? Mm. That's what you just did. That's what you just did. You all laughed because it was a little uncomfortable. It was unusual to hear a guest speaker say that on the first day he's speaking or even the last day he's speaking. Welcome to Robert Slayerton. I don't care. I'm fighting for your success. I am fighting to get you the money you need to take care of the hungry people you're responsible for and to take care of your family so your kids will follow Jesus after you and not run from him because you were so broke you couldn't even buy him a bicycle. And I'm a bad guy because I talk about money to you. I'm a bad guy because I'm an American that talks about money. So you, it's American gospel. What American wrote what part of the Bible? Name it. Was Jeremiah from Missouri? What, what, what person in the Bible was American? That is the most stupidest thing that you Europeans can believe. There is no such thing as a European gospel, an American gospel. The reason why you say because you don't like what we get because we believe certain parts of the Bible and you don't. That's why we believe in money. And that's why we have the biggest ministries, the loudest voices for Christianity, because we get the money to take the message of God to the world. And it can work for you too. But you have to change your European mindset. And you're going to lose some of your friends because they want preachers to be poor. That's how they know you're holy. That's how you know they're stupid. Because they think like that. Good preaching, Brother Roberts. Amen. All right? Jesus was not poor. According to most people, he is the most famous homeless man in world history. Do you really think Jesus didn't have a house? Do you think that Jesus lived here for 33 years, homeless? Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus did not have a home as an adult man? Do you, do you really think that's how he lived? That's how you preach it? You take one story in Luke 9, when he sends his disciples to go to the city of front of him to say, can I come in? And they say no. And he goes down and meets this young guy and he makes a comment. Birds have a place, foxes have a place, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And you make a one-time incident a lifestyle. That's what you do. Like, Jesus was born and he was born in a barn. Really? Okay. Did you read the rest of the verse? Why? Because the Hilton Hotel was full. That's what it says. So it implies he had money to go to the hotel. He preferred to be at the inn. He had money to get into the inn. But there was no room. Hello. But now we got Jesus born in a barn with all the animals. Because he's poor. Read the Bible, you stupid thing. Read the Bible for yourself. Read it. Read it. Read the rest of the story. When you read the Bible, your poverty tradition dies. It dies. It dies. Jesus had an incident in his travels where the community that he wanted to spend the night in would not let him. He had no place to sleep that night. And we make it a lifestyle. He never had a house. He never had a home. Okay. 
a prosperity preacher is this. One that believes God wants to help you financially. That's all it is. And will teach you what the Bible says about it. There are people who have taken those verses and used them for the wrong thing. Yes, they have. I know some of them. I'm like, please shut up. I'll give you the 10 grand if you'll just shut up. I'll give you the money you need. We just shut up and go on and preach. We've all been in those. Now, I accept that happens. But that doesn't change what the Word says, no matter how many of those idiots have misused those Scriptures. And you have to believe them for yourself and quit letting the person who taught them wrong or did them wrong be your point of reference. Your point of reference has to be chapter and verse, not these crazy idiots. Because the Word still works for you if it'll work, if you'll work it. Jesus said, sow and you reap. Now, when you think you're preaching prosperity like that, well, you're, you're greedy. Let me, let me kill that. If you tithe and give offerings, you've killed greed. You already do that. How many of you tithe? Put your hand up. You tithe in your church. You're, you're givers of tithe. Put your hand up. You tithe? Put your hand up if you tithe. I want to see it. All right? Notice, now everybody understand my English? Everybody get that? If you give money to Jesus, raise your hand. All right, that worked. That was good. All right, we got there. That part was a language barrier there. So I assume ministers in the making learn how to tithe. All right? You kill greed by those two things up front. So the prosperity message can't make you greedy because you killed it when you've worked it. By giving, you conquer greed. By tithing and giving, you conquer greed. So if you do the biblical thing, you're not greedy. Greed cannot be in there. How am I going to preach on money until I get done? Because you need this. You need it. Not most, most European preachers won't talk like this to you. They're scared. They're scared to say, why don't you give some more money so you get some more money? Prosperity is good. They get mad. I don't care. I like being rich. Rich is in the Bible. Rich is a God word. Poor is a devil word. Poverty is of the enemy. You were not born with a poor nature. You were born with a rich nature. Take a child to a candy store and say, get what you want. He picks up the biggest piece of candy in there. That's a rich nature. He didn't pick a small little thing. He picks the big thing. Take a child on an airplane and say, well, where would you like to sit? Where's he going to sit? In the big seats up front. Rich nature. We're the only part of God's creation that'll pay for a meal with an ambiance. A cow don't care how he eats. A pig don't care how he eats. We do. We'll pay extra to have someone bring the food to us like that and not like that. That's a rich nature. You like that. The reason why you dress the way you do because you have a rich nature. There's nothing wrong with your rich nature. Just manage it. Quit fighting it and manage it. You still with me? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to your seminar. All the guys we talk about had to raise money. And one of the biggest jobs in preaching after preaching is money. I'm not into money. Yes, you are. Everybody's into money. You have to have money to do anything. So quit saying, I'm not into money. You're into money. If I give you $10,000, you'd smile bigger. You'd be happy. Wow, that's what I am. That's so great. Why do we fight this? Let's embrace it and manage it. You're going to have to have money to do what you're called to do. Michael Jackson estate is not going to pay you. It's going to come God's way. And the reason why we get upset is because the devil doesn't want Christians to have money because we do good things with it. That's why he doesn't want Christians to have money. Because when you get money, you'll do good things. You'll help people. That's, it's our nature. It's the God nature in us. That's why the devil wants you to be poor, so you can't do those things. 
Are you with me? Michael Jackson bought a chimpanzee. True story. I saw it. Put a diaper on it and walks to the malls of America with his monkey. And nobody got mad at Michael Jackson and his chimpanzee. Let a pastor buy a new car and see what happens. Let a pastor go on three holidays in a year that I just talked about and see what happens. Good preaching, Brother Robert. Amen. Are you still alive? Okay. Just let that kind of sink in for a minute. People come to my country for our money. If you come to America, we'll give you the money you need to build your church or whatever you do. We love to do it. That's why we're a prosperous country. My nation operates in the laws of giving and receiving. We give more to the gospel than any other nation in the world. And part of the blessing coming back on our people is what God promised 30, 60, 100 fold. I'm glad we're like that. May we never stop giving to the people of the world for the gospel's sake. Just keep going. America is great. For one, well, one of the reasons why she's great is because we're a giving people. And everybody knows it. And even when we're done wrong and they take our money for the wrong cause, we still give next week. We like it. I wish you were like that. I wish the Swiss was like that. You're not quite like that, are you? You're like, well, we give, but we, and it's coming, that's why I'm helping pushing it. It's this kind of rawness you need to hear. Let me give you one scripture, and I'll change the subject. I think, Mark 10, go to Mark 10 real fast. This guy built a city. He had to have money to build a city. He built a city with 30,000 citizens in it. He had to have money. Or Roberts built a university and a hospital. He had to have money to do that. Reinhard Bonnke did the biggest crusades in her lifetime, and they cost him over a million dollars plus for every big crusade. He had to have money. Why isn't money a bigger deal in Bible college training? Because most of the guys that are running it are scared of it themselves. Good preaching, everybody. Sure, it's quiet now. We were happier at the last break. Notice how quiet it gets when you talk about money. The other thing you need to talk about is sex. The reason why we have sex problems is because we don't talk about it. All right, Mark 10. Verse 29, love you. You're wonderful. Thanks for having me. I'm really trying to teach the generals, but there are certain things I think the Lord wants to say and to provoke your heart and your mind on certain things. Jesus says in, in uh, verse 28, Peter said, begin to say, lo, we left everything and followed you. That's what you're doing. You're leaving everything and you're following Jesus. Is that right? Some of you could be business people. Other kinds of, of careers you could take, but you've chosen to follow Jesus and say, I want to represent Jesus, I want to work for Jesus. I, I respect that. That's a big jump to come into the ministry. And Peter says what we think sometimes, I've left everything and I'm following you. And Jesus answered and said, verily, verily, I say unto you, Mark 10, 29, no person has left their house their brethren, their sisters, their father, their mother, their wife, or, children, or lands for my sake and the gospel. Verse 30. But is a conjunction. Connecting what was said with what's about to be said. It's the same flow. But he or she shall receive a hundredfold now. Everybody say now. now that's crazy. Now. Everybody say now. See how weak you are? Listen to that. Say now. That's a little better. Now, in this life, in this time, houses, 
brethren, sisters, mothers, children, and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. So he's not talking about heaven because then he says, and then in the world to come eternal life. He's talking about this life now. Notice Jesus said, if you give up houses, lands, for my name and the gospels, you shall receive houses. That's more than one. Houses. Houses. What am I going to do with your house? Rent out and make money for your family. Duh. Welcome to ministry. Receive houses, mothers, sisters, brethren. And there's that little phrase, with persecution. Okay, here it, here it is. Broke, no persecution. Survival, no persecution. Loaded with persecutions. Which one do you want? Which one do you want? Do you want houses? Brethren? Lands? It'll come, but it comes with persecutions. What's per people that don't like it, that talk bad about you. He has all that money. And you obviously don't. You have money with persecution. You have no money and no persecution. Which one do you want? Which do you want? Think about it. Right here in our nice Christian seminar. I don't have enough, but I love Jesus. And everybody thinks well of me because I'm broke like them. Or I have enough money, take care of my family, take care of the poor around me, to send missionaries, to pay people's medical bills. I have money. And they don't like me. They talk bad about me because I have money. Look at what he does. He goes on holiday. How evil is that? Look at what he's doing. He pays people's medical bills because they don't have any money, and him and his church does because they walk in the laws of abundance, and so they can walk in and pay it all off or pay their rent or their mortgage. Why, they've been sick and they lost their job, and the, the society don't help them as much, and the church comes in and takes care of it. Or you have a Bible school, and you send all your graduates overseas for a year and pay for the whole year for them. Wow. Broke and everybody likes you. Have money. People don't like you, but you do all the good stuff. What do you want? What do you want? Is it getting uncomfortable yet? I'm pushing it. I'm pushing. I asked Or Roberts how much money he raised in his lifetime for the gospel. You want to know the amount? One billion point five hundred million U.S. dollars. Or Roberts raised in ninety years of life with Jesus. Wow. Wow. One billion, not million, billion, 500 million, one man raised for the gospel. How did he do it? By seed faith, by giving and receiving. That's how he did it. I knew him. Wow. Wow. So I ask him, 
Where's it all at? If you raised a billion and a half, where's it at? He goes, have you walked on my university? He built the first spirit-filled base university accredited in the world. Sits out there in South Tulsa. Across the street, he built a 60-story building high in the middle, 30 on the left and 20 on the right, and merged medicine and healing prayer together in the world. It took $200 million just to build the building. It was 777 hospital beds in the middle. Where's the money at? He pioneered Christian television in the 1950s. When the church said TV was of the devil, it was called the Hellavision. That's what they called it back then. I love church history. It's so fun. It's better than cartoons in a movie. If you just read it, it's, just, it's amazing. In 1950, this little box called the television was starting in America. And everybody was buying televisions and getting TV dinners in America. That's where that whole started. Or Roberts had a tent. That would seat 10, 12,000, and sometimes there'd be 20,000 people a night hearing him preach under a tent. And he noticed that the Americans were all watching TV now. And he thought, I want to be on TV. Now, that was like sin. Sin. But that's where the people were. That was the marketplace of the day. So he told all these Pentecostal people by the thousands, goes, I'm going to go on TV. <gasps> they thought he'd lost his salvation. They thought the devil had taken him over. He went ahead and did it. He could find no Christian to help him. Do TV calls Christians didn't believe that you should be in television. These camera people running around the room here and all this stuff we have with the media. Our ancestors would call this of the devil. That's what they think. They didn't like TV. They barely liked radio. Can you imagine if they saw our TV today, what they would say? He had to go to Hollywood to find somebody that would come to his tent and put in the lights and the cameras. And they weren't Christians. The first two people told him, you can't do it. You keep find, you keep asking until somebody says, yes, you can. He found that guy. They put in the big lights and the cameras, and they watched the young man or Roberts preach. They filmed it, and he laid his hands on the sick, and they watched them get healed. And he put it on television. And they weren't quite sure if they should let this happen. To make sure it wasn't fake, he had to get a judge in every city to stand at the prayer line and watch what was happening to make sure there was no shenanigans and the judge had to sign off on it as authentic before they could air it on television. He did it. But now they weren't sure, I love this story, if they want to put this faith healer on television. And Or Roberts hired a young guy about your age, kind of looks like you. He's dead now though. He's a good friend of mine. He, he was a great, great guy. He was wonderful. He was hired to get Oral Roberts on all the TV stations in America. And how do you do that? He had to create, he had to figure out what to do. He liked Rolls Royce cars. The young, the young guy did. And that Sunday in Tulsa where, the, where they live, there was a Rolls Royce car show that was ending Sunday afternoon. So he went to church and took his family and drove back home and dropped them off at the house and he drove to the show to see the Rolls Royce cars because he dislikes them. He wants to buy one one day. He's more Pentecostal, but he has hope. He'll get to buy a Rolls Royce one day, you know. He stands there and, and everybody's gone but an old man, an older man and him look at the latest Rolls Royce car. 
And the old guy says to Lonnie Rex, the young guy, you like the car? He said, sir, one day I hope that I have enough money to buy a Rolls Royce car. I always want one. I don't have it now, but I really hope and believe that one day I'll be able to buy one before I die. The guy said, yeah, I bought my wife one a few years ago. I'm about thinking about buying her this new one here. And they walked out together talking about their love for the Rolls Royce car. The old man says to the young guy, what do you do for a living? He goes, I work for Evangelist or Roberts. He, got, he closed up. Why are you talking to me? He goes, well, I don't know. I just thought we'd like Rolls Royce cars, and we were walking out talking about it. You know who I am? No, an old man that likes Rolls Royce cars. Go buy one for your wife. That's all I know. Seriously. He happened to be the guy that was in charge of all the TV stations in America the governmental guy in charge of all the TV stations in America. And Lonnie Rick said, well, since you're that guy, I do need to talk to you. God had arranged, directed the steps of that young man to meet the man that was in charge of the TV stations. And by that evening, or Roberts had access to over 500 American TV stations. Within a year, America was eating dinner and watching Or Roberts on television. God is a good God. Devil's a bad devil. Bible days are here again. Come and receive the blessing of God. We'll pray for you. He will save your soul. He will heal your body and give you a new life. And the America was in shock of this young man. He said, and to prove that he's here, watch God heal the sick. And while they were eating dinner, or whoop, bam, and bam, they get healed. And they came by the thousands to hear Old Roberts preach. The newspapers in my country said the last night of his tent meetings, he'd pray for everybody, no matter how long it took. Our newspaper should say, in some of those towns, the prayer line was two miles long from the tent. Two miles. Two miles of that. He would end at the end of the prayer, dripping sweat through his suit and his shoes and his socks. They would pour the sweat out of his shoes. Yeah, it's gross, but that's what happened. Just to show you what, what it was. He took his gift and prayed for the masses. He was on TV. America watched him. President Kennedy was watching him and invited him to the White House. He was on TV. Richard Nixon invited him to the White House because Richard Nixon was not good on TV and Oral Roberts was great. Asked him to come and help the president to be better on television. Or Roberts, the healing preacher. He did that because he had money to pay for the TV time, to come on television and do everything he just went, wow. It took money. Good morning. And you know what you're called to do? Think about it right now. What are you called to do? What are you called to do? It's bigger than you. It's large, it's wonderful, it's exciting to, to dream. It's going to take money to do it, isn't it? And you know why am I the bad guy for trying to get you to believe what the Bible says over money? I'm fighting to get you in the place where God can do for you what he did for Oral and everybody else. He has no favorites. He'll do the same thing for anybody that works the word on any part of it. The money part too. The problem is, I got to get you to start doing it and believing it so it can happen to you. I'm embarrassed to talk about money. That has to go. 
Think about your call. Think about Bonky. Think about Reinhard Bonky. Y'all like Bonky. He's German. He's like you. He's rude. <laughs> Reinhard Bonky, you're Swiss. Okay, I understand. I understand, I understand. You are nicer than the German Germans. I'm half German, by the way, so I can talk like that. My real name was Croft. My father's name was Croft. My mom remarried after she divorced. My new father, my stepfather, was French. So we became Lairdons. So I'm English, German, with a French last name. Explains a lot, doesn't it? All right, so I'm, I'm German. That's why I'm the way I am. Germans make the world go around. Or we cause wars, one or the other. So let's have a reformation. Let's have a revival. But you have to pay for it. How are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it? I know I'm going on and on. But if I don't, it'll go in this ear and run out that ear. So I keep putting it in, hoping it'll stay in there for a minute and think. How much do you need to do your call? How much do you need to take care of the people you're responsible for before God? How much do you need to educate the children you're not responsible for in that village? What do you need? How much do you need? How are you going to get it? God made a way. You take what you have and you sow it somewhere. And it grows. And it comes back. That's the way it works. Well, I don't like it. Well, then you won't have it. It's that simple. And that's how you keep the rich people who want to control your church from controlling it because you make your own money that way with God. Can you say amen? Now, do you still like me or should I go home now? Now, one last thing before this subject. I don't know what time it is, but Dowie's a great guy. We'll get to him in a minute. Can you preach this in your church? Can you get up on a Sunday morning and preach it like I've just talked it to you? I didn't have to give you all the verses, but you could do the verses. You teach it. You lay it out there. Can you please ask Jesus to help you get over all your paranoia and embarrassment about money and get into it the right way, with the right heart, the right disposition, and help your people get there and go there? My church... 2,000 people. And we made pretty good money just 2,000 people doing the little donation thing. But I decided I wanted to be a, a church that works with prosperity in the Scriptures. Not because I wanted their money. I wanted them to have their own money because they were all broke and didn't own nothing. They lived in rented houses. They didn't own anything hardly. Very few owned them, owned the, owned the property. And I began to teach like this. And within seven years, we had more people owning, out of debt, living well, and my church became a $12 million a year income church. And I didn't do anything but talk like I talk to you right now. Just real straight, real forward, with no shame. Just whoom. That's why I sent all the Bible school students like you overseas for a year with your wife and kids and paid for it. That's what I did. Isn't that good? Or Roberts built a university to educate you. He went on TV where everybody was watching. He goes, hey, God loves you. He wants to save you. And thousands, hundreds of thousands came to Jesus. I want you on TV. I want your cute face and, and blunt mouth. Scare the Swiss people half to death. And preach a loud, strong, happy gospel. At first, I'll hate your guts. Keep your shield up. But eventually, it'll work. And it'll change. You're going to have to plow this in your country. And not be ashamed. And don't use the weird Americans that preach it for their own self-gain as your point of reference. That happens, and that's wrong. That's happened. 
And that's why people want to throw it out because of that. You can't throw out the Scriptures because somebody from my country did it wrong. And they do it the worst. And that's why you don't like Americans on prosperity. But I'm trying to separate that for you. No matter how many Americans have come and misused the giving Scriptures, it's still there for you. If you'll work it, it'll work for you. You can't let my countrymen who have done wrong with this message make you throw the whole thing out. It's still there for you. It works for you. Let the Scriptures be your point of reference, not the bad guys that have come and done wrong with it. Thank you, sir. I'm preaching for your benefit. I need an Oral Roberts to show up in Switzerland. I need a Catherine Kuhlman that came on television. How did Catherine Kuhlman was on TV all over America? She had money that God gave her. He needs and he wants to give you all that you need. Everything that you need for your call, for your ministry, he wants to provide the anointing and the natural resources for it. If God wants to give you an airplane, which is a big deal in Europe with preachers and airplanes, but, but hold on, while we're at it, let's just go all the way. What if you need one? What if you really need one? What if what you do needs that type of equipment to do what you're called to do? Couldn't God give it to you? Maybe you need a bus and not an airplane. Maybe you need a big building. What? Big things. God doesn't have a problem giving you big things. You have a problem receiving it. You don't think you deserve it. And you're his kid and you're working for him. And he told you, I'll provide for you. And he's trying to give it to you and you're pushing it back. Good preaching, Brother Roberts. Amen. It's real quiet now in our Bible school situation. I don't know what time. What time do I quit? Midnight or what? Noon? Now? Okay, well, let me finish the airplane thing. I'll come back tonight and do all the fun. Pre Are you having fun? Are you enjoying this? Yes. All right, so I, I, I'm, I'm trying. I need, I need to get you out of here. Okay, let me. I bought an airplane. Okay. I bought an airplane. I'll, I'll do the airplane story and I'll quit. Whoever's in charge, give me a minute. Because I needed one. I lived on the West Coast, and I traveled and preached every day in a different church. In those days, there, were so, there was a revival in America, and I preached in five different cities a week, plus went home and pastored my church on the West Coast. In my spiritual, I said, you need a plane, you're going to die trying to do it commercially because they don't always work right I mean, in the time. And I owned a plane for like seven years. That's how long I needed it. When I finished in California, I sold it. I didn't need it no more. I needed a plane just for seven years. Now I don't. I got rid of it. It wasn't an identity thing. I wasn't in the airplane club. It was a tool. When they delivered my plane to me, I called it Go One. Is that nice? Go One. I'm believing for Go Two. That maybe somewhere in my life I might get another one. I don't know, but it'd be nice. I do miss the plane during COVID. It's been nice to have a plane during that, that crisis, you know. And it's fun. Believe me, it's fun to have a plane. You can do lunch in Seattle and be home for dinner in L.A. And when you're dating, it's really impressive. <laughs> All right, so that's the fun part. But the overall reason was, was for my ministry. They, did fun. They, they delivered the plane to me. They did it refurbished the inside, and, and I bought a mid-sized Hawker plane. It wasn't the biggest yet. It was the size plane that I needed for what I was doing. Planes fit different type of things. You have to know what you're in and find the plane that fits your need. Okay? And it was like a car. You've got to find the car that fits your need. Now, this thing just flies instead of rolls. It's the only difference, you know. It's, and it costs a little bit more. Okay, no, follow me, follow me. And they landed, and I'm sitting out the, at the airport, and it was a great day. Came in at night with all the blinking lights. They landed it, and they walked off the plane and said, are you Mr. Laird? I said, I am. This is your plane. He goes, thank you. And they actually rolled out the red carpet for you, to, actually red carpet. It's really nice. When you have red carpet, here's what you do. You walk on it. 
and you enjoy the red carpet. See, notice how you're all reacting. Some of you are like, you have a problem. If they give you red carpet, don't walk around it. You're supposed to walk on it. So they rolled out the red carpet, and I walked onto the plane, and I stepped across into the plane the first time as the owner. I said to the Lord, why did it take so long for me to get this plane? Because it still hasn't like it took forever for this plane to show up in my life. Here's what he said. Just that fast. It took you that long to figure out it's a tool, not a status symbol. Right there, I learned one of the biggest lessons in ministry. God has no problem giving you what we call the big items as long as it's a tool, not a status symbol. The problem is the big items sometimes make us feel something. He will give you a plane, a truck, a bus, a boat, whatever you need to do what he's asked you to do. He gives you a building. As long as it's a tool, it's not a status symbol. The love of money is the root of all evil, not money. The attitude toward it is the issue. And that's the biggest problem with this whole thing. It's the, your attitude toward money. He'll give you whatever you need. When we go through the stories tonight and tomorrow, I want you to watch how God provides big items for these people. Because you're in the next generation. He wants to provide those items for your call. You need a building that fits the crowd that you've got. You need the vans to bring the people to church or the food to the people. You, you, you need those things. And he'll give you all of them. As long as it's a tool, not a status symbol. When I sold my plane because I moved to Europe, I went to England for five years. It never bothered me that my plane days were over. I live on the East Coast now, and I don't need a plane. Most of America lives on this side of the Mississippi. I was on the West Coast. I don't need that anymore. It's okay. I had one for a while, but I needed it. Now I don't. It's okay. Can you be like that? You can have a big item. Everybody gets mad at Kenneth Copeland. You all know who Kenneth Copeland is? He's got has these big planes. He, he was a pilot his whole life. He's a famous preacher. And he has a big plane. Really, it's a really nice plane. It's, wow, it's a nice plane. Wow. Wow. Okay. I owned one, and he still makes me go, wow. Okay, it's one of those. Now, he has given away 27 airplanes. Gave them away. 27 airplanes. Think about it, think about it. Not bicycles. Not motorcycles. Airplanes. Whew, airplanes. What do you reap when you sow planes? Planes. Start sowing cars and see what shows up in your life. Start sowing things. And it comes back multiplied. Don't get mad at a guy that has a wow plane. <laughs> and don't get mad and persecute him until you investigate and find out how he lived. He wrote Bonky, a million dollar check for every crusade until he died. Kenneth Copeland did. That's why they found oil on his land. And they pump oil every day on God's land and cash rolleth in. <laughs> and they go all over the world doing the ministry, feeding the people, crises. When our nation was leaving out of Afghanistan and the Christians were being killed, he sent that wow plane to pick up Christians out of those nations and flew them home. You can't do that if you're broke. But if you got money, I'm going to go pull those Christians before the Muslims kill them. Lands his plane, fills it up, 
flies them out, goes back, and starts. That's all it is, guys. That's all it is. Give, and it shall be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your life. For the way you gave, it shall be measured back to you again. That's Jesus. I think we should believe that verse too. Father, we thank you for this morning. We let these words echo. And I ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Take what I've said and adjust it in any way that I've said things out of order, or out of placement, and that it fit in the heart and the mind of these students. Holy Spirit, you're the great teacher. Teach them and teach me how to walk in all your blessings, including the financial side. Because we want to do our ministries and fulfill our life goals. And we thank you, Lord, for this help from heaven on earth. Help us renew our minds and do what's right with us. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. And say, I love Roberts. <laughs> put your arms around you like this and put your arms around you like this and squeeze real tight. Can you do that? Can you put your arms around you and squeeze real tight? That's a hug from Roberts Lairdon. I know I went off my main subject today, but I pray that it was the right thing for this moment for you to understand and to consider. Amen? Amen. I'll see you a little bit later. You want to dismiss? Yes, thank you so much, Robert, for this uh, topic this morning. Yeah. Vielen Dank dass du dieses Thema heute Morgen mitgebracht hast. Yeah, I think it's already enough to actually think about it, let it sink in, talk about it and pray about it. Um, yeah, I think we need to hear more about this. Thank you so much. Das, was er gesagt hat, war super, ja, genau. <lacht> yes. Ja, wir werden uns jetzt Zeit nehmen, das zu verdauen. Es gibt jetzt nämlich die Mittagspause, die geht bis halb zwei. Um 13.30 Uhr werden wir uns wieder hier treffen. Man kann entweder hier im Connect essen, ihr dürft euch dort draußen äh, einen Stuhl schnappen und dort essen. Bitte verrückt aber die Tische und die äh, Stühle nicht zu sehr. Das Connect bitte darum, dass alles so bleibt, wie es jetzt aussieht. Ihr könnt aber auch äh, irgendwo in ein Restaurant gehen, seid einfach pünktlich um halb zwei wieder hier. Und ein Gratis-Tipp noch, wer noch nicht genug Körperkontakt hatte, kommt in die erste Reihe. <lacht> Nach dem Mittag, genau. Wir sehen uns um halb zwei. Ja, gut.